This is Tape 3, Side 1. The Advent of Divine Justice by Shoghi Effendi. Continuing from page 72. Such, dearly beloved friends, is the vista that stretches before the eyes and challenges the resources of the American Baha'i community in these, the concluding years of the first century of the Baha'i era. Such are the qualities and qualifications demanded of them for the proper discharge of their responsibilities and duties. Such are the requirements, the possibilities, and the objectives of the plan that claims every ounce of their energy. Who knows but that these few remaining fast-fleeting years may not be pregnant with events of unimaginable magnitude, with ordeals more severe than any that humanity has yet experienced, with conflicts more devastating than any which have preceded them. Dangers, however sinister, must at no time dim the radiance of their newborn faith. Strife and confusion, however bewildering, must never befog their vision. Tribulations, however afflictive, must never shatter their resolve. Denunciations, however clamorous, must never sap their loyalty. Upheavals, however cataclysmic, must never deflect their course. The present plan, embodying the budding hopes of a departed master, must be pursued, relentlessly pursued, whatever may befall them in the future, however distracting the crises that may agitate their country or the world. Far from yielding in their resolve, far from regrowing oblivious of their task, they should at no time, however much buffeted by circumstances, forget that the synchronization of such world-shaking crises with the progressive unfoldment and fruition of their divinely appointed task is itself the work of providence, the design of an inscrutable wisdom, and the purpose of an all-compelling will, a will that directs and controls in its own mysterious way both the fortunes of the faith and the destinies of men. Such simultaneous processes of rise and fall, of integration and disintegration, of order and chaos, with their continuous and reciprocal reactions on each other, are but aspects of a greater plan, one and indivisible, whose source is God, whose author is Baha'u'llah, the theater of whose operation is the entire planet, and whose ultimate objectives are the unity of the human race and the peace of all mankind. Page 73. Reflections such as these should steal the resolve of the entire Baha'i community, should dissipate their forebodings, and arouse them to rededicate themselves to every single provision of that divine charter whose outline has been delineated for them by the pen of Abdul Baha. The seven-year plan, as already stated, is but the initial stage, a stepping stone to the unfoldment of the implications of this charter. The impulse originally generated through the movement of that pen and which is now driving forward with increasing momentum the machinery of the seven-year plan must in the opening years of the next century be further accelerated and impel the American Baha'i community to launch further stages in the unfoldment of the divine plan, stages that will carry it far beyond the shores of the North Northern Hemisphere into lands and among peoples where that community's noblest acts of heroism are to be performed. Let anyone inclined to doubt the course which this enviable community is destined to follow, turn to and meditate upon these words of Abdu Baha, enshrined for all time in the tablets of the divine plan and addressed to the entire community of the believers of the United States and Canada. Quote, the full measure of your success, he informs them, quote, is as yet unrevealed, its significance still unapprehended. Ere long ye will, with your own eyes, witness how brilliantly every one of you, even as a shining star, will radiate in the firmament of your country the light of divine guidance, and will bestow upon its people the glory of an everlasting life. The range of your future achievements still remains undisclosed. I fervently hope that in the near future the whole earth may be stirred and shaken by the results of your achievements. The hope, therefore, which Bhagavad Maha cherishes for you is that the same successes which has attended your efforts in America may crown your endeavors in other parts of the world, that through you the fame of the cause of God may be diffused throughout the East and the West, and the advent of the kingdom of the Lord of hosts be proclaimed in all the five continents of the globe. 
The moment, he most significantly adds, this divine message is carried forward by the American believers from the shores of America and is propagated through the continents of Europe, of Asia, of Africa, and of Australasia, and as far as the islands of the Pacific, this community will find itself securely established upon the throne of an everlasting dominion. Then will all the peoples of the world witness that this community is spiritually illumined and divinely guided. Then will the whole earth resound with the praises of its majesty and greatness. End quote. No reader of these words, so vibrant with promises that not even the triumphant consummation of the seven year plan can fulfill, can expect a community that has been raised so high and endowed so richly to remain content with any laurels it may win in the immediate future. To rest upon such laurels would indeed be tantamount to a betrayal of the trust placed in that community by Abdu Baha. To cut short the chain of victories that must lead it on to the supreme triumph when the whole earth may be stirred and shaken by the results of its achievements would shatter his hopes. To facilitate and fail to propagate through the continents of Europe, of Asia, of Africa, and of Australasia, and as far as the islands of the Pacific, a message so magnificently proclaimed by it in the American continent would deprive it of the privilege of being securely established upon the throne of an everlasting dominion. To forfeit the honor of proclaiming the advent of the kingdom of the Lord of hosts in all the five continents of the globe would silence those praises of its majesty and greatness that otherwise would echo throughout the whole earth. Such vacillation, failure, or neglect, the American believers, the ambassadors of the faith of Baha'u'llah, will, I am firmly convinced, never permit. Such a trust will never be betrayed, such hopes can never be shattered, such a privilege will never be forfeited, nor will such praises remain unuttered. 75. Nay, rather, the present generation of this blessed, this repeatedly blessed community will go from strength to strength and will hand on, as the first century draws to a close, to the generations that must succeed it in the second, the torch of divine guidance, undimmed by the tempestuous winds that must blow upon it, that they, in turn, faithful to the wish and mandate of Abu Baha, may carry that torch with that self-same vigor, fidelity, and enthusiasm to the darkest and remotest corners of the earth. Dearly beloved friends, I can do no better, eager as I am to extend to every one of you an assistance in my power that may enable you to discharge more effectively your dear divinely appointed, continually multiplying duties, than to direct your special attention at this decisive hour to these immortal passages gleaned in part from the great mass of Baha'u'llah's unpublished and untranslated writings. Whether in his revelation of the station and functions of his loved ones, or his eulogies of the greatness of his cause, or his emphasis on the paramount importance of teaching, or the dangers which he foreshadows, the counsels he imparts, the warnings he utters, the vistas he chose, discloses, and the assurances and promises he gives, these dynamic and typical examples of Baha'u'llah's sublime utterance, each having a direct bearing on the task which actually face or lie ahead of the American Baha'i community, cannot fail to produce on the minds and hearts of any of one of its members who approaches them with befittingly, befitting humility and detachment such powerful reactions as to illuminate his entire being and intensify tremendously his daily exertions. Reader's note, the uh, quotations do go on for approximately nine pages, so... Uh, I will just simply begin the quotes and let you know when it ends. Quote, O friends, be not careless of the virtues with which ye have been endowed, neither be neglectful of your high destiny. Ye are the stars of the heaven of understanding, the breeze that stirreth at the break of day, the soft flowing waters upon which must depend the very life of all men, the letters inscribed upon his sacred scroll. O people of Baha, ye are the breezes of spring that are wafted over the world. Through you we have adorned the world of being with the ornament of the knowledge of the most merciful. Through you the countenance of the world hath been wreathed in smiles, and the brightness of his light shone forth. Cling ye to the court of steadfastness in such wise that all vain imaginings may utterly vanish. Speed ye forth from the horizon of power in the name of your Lord, the unconstrained, and announce unto his servants with wisdom and eloquence the tidings of this cause, 
whose splendor hath been shed upon the world of being. Beware lest anything withhold you from observing the things prescribed unto you by the pen of glory, as it moved over his tablet with sovereign majesty and might. Great is the blessedness of him that hath hearkened to its shrill voice, as it was raised through the power of truth before all who are in heaven and all who are on earth. O people of Baha, the river that is life indeed hath flowed for your sakes. Quaff ye in my name, despite them that have disbelieved in God, the Lord of Revelation. We have made you to be the hands of our cause. Render ye victorious this wronged one, who hath been sore tried in the hands of the workers of iniquity. He verily will aid every one that aideth him, and will remember every one that remembereth him. To this beareth witness this tablet that, that hath shed the splendor of the loving kindness of your Lord, the all glorious, the all compelling. Blessed are the people of Baha. God beareth me witness. They are the solace of the eye of creation. Through them the universes have been adorned, and the preserved tablet embellished. They are the ones who have sailed on the ark of complete independence with their faces set towards the day springs of beauty. How great is their blessedness that they have attained unto what their Lord, the omniscient, the all-wise, hath willed. Through their light the heavens have been adorned, and the faces of those that have drawn nigh unto him made to shine. By the sorrows which afflict the beauty of the all-glorious, such is the station ordained for the true believer, that if to an extent smaller than a needle's eye, the glory of that station were to be unveiled to mankind, every beholder would be consumed away in his longing to attain it. For this reason it hath been decreed that in this earthly life the full measure of the glory of his own station should remain concealed from the eyes of such a believer. If the veil be lifted and the full glory of the station of those who have truly turned towards God and in their love for him renounce the world be made manifest, the entire creation would be dumbfounded. Verily I say, no one hath apprehended the root of this cause. It is incumbent upon every one in this day to perceive with the eye of God and to hearken with his ear. Whoso beholdeth me with an eye besides mine own will never be able to know me. None among the manifestations of old, except to a prescribed degree, hath ever completely apprehended the nature of this revelation. I testify before God to the greatness, the inconceivable greatness of this revelation. Again and again have we, in most of our tablets, borne witness to this truth, that mankind may be roused from its heedlessness. How great is the cause, how staggering the weight of its message! In this most mighty revelation, all the dispensations of the past have attained their highest, their final consummation. That which hath been manifest in this preeminent, this most exalted revelation, stands unparalleled in the annals of the past, nor will future ages witness its like. The purpose underlying all creation is the revelation of this most sublime, this most holy day, the day known as the day of God in his books and scriptures, the day which all the prophets and the chosen ones and the holy ones have wished to witness. The highest essence and most perfect expression of whatever the peoples of old have either said or written hath, through this most potent revelation, been sent down from the heaven of the will of the all-possessing, the ever-abiding God. This is the day in which God's most excellent favors have been poured out upon men, the day in which his most mighty grace hath been infused into all created things. This is the day whereon the ocean of God's mercy hath been manifested unto men, the day in which a day-star of his loving kindness hath shed its radiance upon them, the day in which the clouds of his bountiful favor have overshadowed the whole of mankind. By the righteousness of mine own self, great, immeasurably great, is this cause. Mighty, inconceivably mighty, is this day. Every prophet hath announced the coming of this day, and every messenger hath groaned in his yearning for this revelation, a revelation which, no sooner had it been revealed, than all created things cried out, saying, The earth is God's, the most exalted, the most great. The day of the promise is come, and he who is the promised one loudly proclaimeth before all who are in heaven and all who are on earth, Verily there is none other God but he, the help and peril of the self-subsisting. I swear by God, that which hath been enshrined from eternity and the knowledge of God, the knower of the seen and unseen, is revealed. 
Happy is the eye that seeth, and the face that turneth towards the countenance of God, the Lord of all being. Great indeed is this day. The allusions made to it in all the sacred scriptures as the day of God attest its greatness. The soul of every prophet of God, of every divine messenger, hath thirsted for this wondrous day. All the diverse kindreds of the earth have likewise yearned to attain it. This day a door is open wider than both heaven and earth. The eye of the mercy of him who is the desire of the worlds is turned towards all men. An act, however infinitesimal, is, when viewed in the mirror of the knowledge of God, mightier than a mountain. Every drop proffered in his path is as the sea in that mirror. For this is the day which the one true God, glorified be he, hath announced in all his books unto his prophets and his messengers. This is a revelation under which, if a man shed for its sake one drop of blood, myriads of oceans will be his recompense. A fleeting moment in this day excelleth the centuries of a bygone age. Neither sun nor moon hath witnessed a day such as this day. This is the day whereon the unseen world crieth out, Great is thy blessedness, O earth, for thou hast been made the footstool of thy God, and been chosen as the seat of his mighty throne. The world of being, sh of being shineth in this day with the resplendency of his divine revelation. All created things extol its saving grace and sing its praises. The universe is wrapped in an ecstasy of joy and gladness. The scriptures of past dispensations celebrate the great jubilee that must needs greet this most great day of God. Well is it with him that hath lived to see this day and hath recognized its station. This day a different sun hath arisen and a different heaven hath been adorned with its stars and its planets. The world is another world, and the cause another cause. Page 79. This is the day which past ages and centuries can never rival. Know this, and be not of the ignorant. This is the day whereon human ears have been privileged to hear what he who conversed with God, Moses, heard upon Sinai, what he who is the friend of God, Muhammad, heard when lifted up towards him, what he who is the spirit of God, Jesus, heard as he ascended unto him the help and peril of the self-subsisting. This day is God's day, and this cause his cause. Happy is he who hath renounced this world and clung to him who is the dayspring of God's revelation. This is the day of, this is the king of days, the day that hath seen the coming of the best beloved, he who through all eternity hath been acclaimed the desire of the world. This is the chief of all days and the king thereof, Great is the blessedness of him who hath attained through the sweet savors of these days unto everlasting life, and who with the most great steadfastness hath arisen to aid the cause of him who is the king of names. Such a man is as the eye to the body of mankind. Peerless is this day, for it is as the eye to past ages and centuries, and as a light unto the darkness of the times. This day is different from other days, and this cause different from other causes. Entreat ye the one true God, that he may deprive not the eyes of men from beholding his signs, nor their ears from hearkening unto the shrill voice of the pen of glory. These days are God's days, a moment of which ages and centuries can never rival. An atom in these days is as the sun, a drop as the ocean. One single breath exhaled in the love of God and for his service is written down by the pen of glory as a princely deed. Were the virtues of this day to be recounted, all would be thunderstruck except those whom the Lord hath exempted. By the righteousness of God, these are the days in which God hath proved the hearts of the entire company of his messengers and prophets, and beyond them those that stand guard over his sacred and inviolable sanctuary, the inmates of the celestial pavilion, and the dwellers of the tabernacle of glory. Should the greatness of this day be revealed in its fullness, every man would forsake a myriad lives in his longing to partake though it be for one moment of its great glory, how much more of this world and its corruptible treasures. God the true one is my witness. This is the day whereon it is incumbent upon every one that seeth to behold, and every ear that hearkeneth to hear, and every heart that understandeth to perceive, and every tongue that speaketh to proclaim unto all who are in heaven and on earth this holy, this exalted, and all highest name. Say, O men, this is a matchless day. 
Matchless must likewise be the tongue that celebrateth the praise of the desire of all nations, and matchless the deed that aspireth to be acceptable in his sight. The whole human race hath longed for this day, that perchance it may fulfill that which well beseemeth its station and is worthy of its destiny. Through the movement of our pen of glory we have, at the bidding of the omnipotent ordainer, breathed a new life into every human frame, and instilled into every word a fresh potency. All created things proclaim the evidences of this worldwide regeneration. O people, I swear by the one true God, this is the ocean out of which all seas have proceeded, and with which every one of them will ultimately be united. From him all the sons have been generated, and unto him they will all return. Through his potency the trees of divine revelation have yielded their fruits, every one of which hath been sent down in the form of a prophet, bearing a message to God's creatures in each of the worlds whose numbers God alone, in all his all-encompassing knowledge, can reckon. This he hath accomplished through the agency of but one letter of his word, revealed by his pen, a pen moved by his directing finger, his finger itself sustained by the power of God's truth. By the righteousness of the one true God, if one speck of a jewel be lost and buried beneath a mountain of stones, and lie hidden beyond the seven seas, the hand of omnipotence would assuredly reveal it in this day, pure and cleansed from dross. Every single letter proceeding from our mouth is endowed with such regenerative power as to enable it to bring into existence a new creation, a creation the magnitude of which is inscrutable to all save God. He hath verily knowledge of all things. It is in our power, should we wish it, to enable a speck of floating dust to generate, in less than the twinkling of an eye, suns of infinite, of unimaginable splendor, to cause a dewdrop to develop into vast and numberless oceans, to infuse into every letter such a force as to empower it to unfold all the knowledge of past and, for and future ages. We are possessed of such power which, if brought to light, will transmute the most deadly of poisons into a panacea of unfailing efficacy. Page 81. The days are approaching their end, and yet the peoples of the earth are seen sunk in grievous heedlessness and lost in manifest error. Great, great is the cause. The hour is approaching when the most great convulsion will have appeared. I swear by him who is the truth, it shall cause separation to afflict everyone, even those who circle round me. Say, O concourse of the heedless, I swear by God, the promised day is come, the day when tormenting trials will have surged above your heads and beneath your feet, saying, Taste ye what your hands have wrought. The time for the destruction of the world and its people hath arrived. He who is the pre-existent is come, that he may bestow everlasting life and grant eternal preservation, and confer that which is conducive to the true living. The day is approaching when its civilizations flame will devour the cities, when the tongue of grandeur will proclaim, The kingdom is God's, the Almighty, the All-Praised. O ye that are bereft of understanding, a severe trial pursueth you, and will suddenly overtake you. Bestir yourselves, that happily it may pass, and inflict no harm upon you. O ye peoples of the world, know verily that an unforeseen calamity is following you, and that grievous retribution awaiteth you. Think not the deeds ye have committed have been blotted from my sight. O heedless ones, though the wonders of my mercy have encompassed all created things, both visible and invisible, and though the revelations of my grace and bounty have permeated every atom of the universe, Yet the rod with which I can chastise the wicked is grievous, and the fierceness of mine anger against them terrible. Grieve thou not over those that have busied themselves with the things of this world, and have forgotten the remembrance of God the Most Great. By him who is the eternal truth, the day is approaching when the wrathful anger of the Almighty will have taken hold of them. He verily is the Omnipotent, the All-Subduing, the Most Powerful. He shall cleanse the earth from the defilement of their corruption, and shall give it for a heritage unto such of his servants as are nigh unto him. Soon will the cry, Yea, yea, here am I, here am I, be heard from every land. For there hath never been, nor can there ever be, any other refuge to fly to for any one. And when the appointed hour is come, there shall suddenly appear that which shall cause the limbs of mankind to quake. Then, and only then, will the divine standard be unfurled, and the nightingale of paradise warble its melody. Page 82. 
In the beginning of every revelation, adversities have prevailed, which later on have turned into great prosperity. Say, O people of God, beware lest the powers of the earth alarm you, or the might of the nations weaken you, or the tumult of the people of discord deter you, or the exponents of earthly glory sadden you. Be ye as a mountain in the cause of your Lord, the Almighty, the All-Glorious, the Unconstrained. Say, Beware, O people of Baha, lest the strong ones of the earth rob you of your strength, or they who rule the world fill you with fear. Put your trust in God and commit your affairs to his keeping. He verily will, through the power of truth, render you victorious, and he verily is powerful to do what he willeth, and in his grasp are the reins of omnipotent might. I swear by my life, nothing save that which profiteth them can befall my loved ones. To this testifieth the pen of God, the most powerful, the all-glorious, the best beloved. Let not the happenings of the world sadden you. I swear by God, the sea of joy yearneth to attain your presence, for every good thing hath been created for you, and will, according to the needs of the times, be revealed unto you. O my servants, sorrow not if in these days and on this earthly plain things contrary to your wishes have been ordained and manifested by God. For days of blissful joy, of heavenly delight, are assuredly in store for you. Words, holy and spiritually glorious, will be unveiled to your eyes. You are destined by him in this world and hereafter to partake of their benefits, to share in their joys, and to obtain a portion of their sustaining grace. To each and every one of them you will no doubt attain. This is the day in which to speak. It is incumbent upon the people of Baha to strive with the utmost patience and forbearance to guide the peoples of the world to the most great horizon. Everybody calleth aloud for a soul. Heavenly souls must needs quicken with the breath of the word of God the dead bodies with a fresh spirit. Within every word a new spirit is hidden. Happy is the man that attaineth thereunto and hath arisen to teach the cause of him who is the king of eternity. Say, O servants, the triumph of this cause hath depended, and will continue to depend, upon the appearance of holy souls, upon the showing forth of goodly deeds, and the revelation of words of consummate wisdom. Center your energies in the propagation of the faith of God, whoso is worthy of so high a calling, let him arise and promote it. Whoso is unable, it is his duty to appoint him who will in his stead proclaim this revelation, whose power hath caused the foundations of the mightiest structures to quake, every mountain to be crushed into dust, and every soul to be dumbfounded. Let your principal concern be to rescue the fallen from the sloth of impending extinction, and to help him embrace the ancient faith of God. Your behavior towards your neighbor such should be such as to manifest clearly the signs of the one true God, for ye are the first among men to be recreated by his Spirit, the first to adore and bow the knee before him, the first to circle round his throne of glory. O ye beloved of God, repose not yourself on your couches, nay, bestir yourselves as soon as you recognize your Lord, the Creator, and hear of the things which have befallen him, and hasten to his assistance. Unloose your tongues, and proclaim unceasingly his cause. This shall be better for you than all the treasures of the past and of the future, if ye be of them that apprehend this truth. I swear by him who is the truth, how long will God adorn the beginning of the book of existence with a mention of his loved ones who have suffered tribulation in his path and journeyed through the countries in his name and for his praise? Whoso hath attained their presence with glory in their meeting, and all that dwell in every land will be illumined by their memory. Vie ye with each other in the service of God and his cause. This is indeed what profiteth you in this world and in that which is to come. Your Lord, the God of mercy, is the all-informed, the all-knowing. Grieve not of the things ye witness in this day. They shall come whereon the tongues of the nations will proclaim. The earth is God's, the Almighty, the single, the incomparable, the all-knowing. Page 84 Blessed is the spot, and the house, and the place, and the city, and the heart, and the mountain, and the refuge, and the cave, and the valley, and the land, and the sea, and the island, and the meadow wherein mention of God hath been made, and his praise glorified. The movement itself from place to place, when undertaken for the sake of God, hath always exerted and can now exert its influence in the world. In the books of old, the station of them that hath voyaged far and near in order to guide the servants of God hath been set forth and written down. 
I swear by God, so great are the things ordained for the steadfast, that were they, so much as the needle eye of a needle, to be disclosed, all who are in heaven and on earth would be dumbfounded, except such as God, the Lord of all worlds, hath willed to exempt. I swear by God, that which hath been destined for him who aideth my cause, excelleth the treasures of the earth. Whoso openeth his lips in this day, and maketh mention of the name of his Lord, the hosts of divine inspiration shall descend upon him from the heaven of my name, the all-knowing, the all-wise. On him shall also descend the concourse on high, each bearing aloft a chalice of pure light. Thus hath it been foreordained in the realm of God's revelation by the behest of him who is the all-glorious, the most powerful. By the righteousness of him who in this day crieth within the inmost heart of all created things, God, there is none other God besides me. If any man were to arise to defend in his writings the cause of God against its assailants, such a man, however inconsiderable his share, shall be so honored in the world to come that the concourse on high would envy his glory. No pen can depict the loftiness of this station, neither can any tongue describe its splendor. Please, God, ye may all be strengthened to carry out that which is the will of God, and may be graciously assisted to appreciate the rank conferred upon such of his loved ones as have risen to serve him and magnify his name. Upon them be the glory of God, the glory of all that is in the heavens and all that is on earth, and the glory of the inmates of the most exalted paradise, the heaven of heavens. O people of Baha, that there is none to rival you is a sign of mercy, Quaff ye of the cup of bounty, the wine of immortality, despite them that have repudiated God, the Lord of names and maker of the heavens. Page 85. I swear by the one true God, this is the day of those who have detached themselves from all but him, the day of those who have recognized his unity, the day whereon God createth with the hands of his power divine beings and imperishable essences, every one of whom will cast the world and all that is therein behind him, and will wax so steadfast in the cause of God that every wise and understanding heart will marvel. There lay concealed within the holy veil, and prepared for the service of God, a company of his chosen ones who shall be manifested unto men, who shall aid his cause, who shall be afraid of no one, though the entire human race rise up in war against them. These are the ones who, before the gaze of the dwellers on earth and the denizens of heaven, shall arise and, shouting aloud, acclaim the name of the Almighty and summon the children of men to the path of God, the all-glorious, the all-praised. The day is approaching when God will have, by an act of his will, raised up a race of men, the nature of which is inscrutable to all save God, the all-powerful, the self-subsisting. He will, ere long, out of the bosom of power, draw forth the hands of ascendancy and might, hands who will arise to win victory for this youth, and who will purge mankind from the defilement of the outcast and the ungodly. These hands will gird up their loins to champion the faith of God, and will, in my name, the self-subsistent, the mighty, subdue the peoples and kindreds of the earth. They will enter the cities, and will inspire with fear the hearts of all their inhabitants. Such are the evidences of the might of God. How fearful, how vehement is his might. That concludes the end of the quotations. One more word in conclusion. Among some of the most momentous and thought-provoking pronouncements ever made by Abdul Baha in the course of his epic-making travels in North American continent are the following. Quoting, May this American democracy be the first nation to establish the foundation of international agreement. May it be the first nation to proclaim the unity of mankind. May it be the first to unfurl the standard of the most great peace. And again, quote, The American people are indeed worthy of being the first to build the tabernacle of the great peace and proclaim the oneness of mankind. For America hath developed powers and capacities greater and more wonderful than other nations, the American nation is equipped and empowered to accomplish that which will adorn the pages of history, to become the envy of the world, and be blessed in both the East and the West for the triumph of its people. The American continent gives signs and evidences of a very great advancement. Its future is even more promising, for its influence and illumination are far-reaching. It will lead all nations spiritually." End quote. 
The creative energies mysteriously generated by the first stirrings of the embryonic world order of Baha'u'llah have, as soon as released within a nation destined to become its cradle and champion, endowed that nation with the worthiness and invested it with the powers and capacities and equipped it spiritually to play the part foreshadowed in these prophetic words. The potencies which this God-given mission has infused into its people are, on the one hand, beginning to be manifested through the conscious efforts and the nationwide accomplishments in both the teaching and administrative spheres of Baha'i activity, of the organized community of the followers of Baha'u'llah in the North American continent. These same potencies, apart from yet collateral with these efforts and accomplishments, are, on the other hand, insensibly shaping, under the same impact of the world political and economic forces, the destiny of that nation, and are influencing the lives and actions of both its government and its peoples. To the efforts and accomplishments of those who, aware of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, are now laboring in that continent, to their present and future course of activity, I have in the foregoing pages sufficiently referred a word if the destiny of the American people in its entirety is to be correctly apprehended should now be said regarding the orientation of that nation as a whole and the trend of the affairs of its people. For no matter how ignorant of the source from which those directing energies proceed and however slow and laborious the process, it is becoming increasingly evident that the nation as a whole, whether through the agency of its government or otherwise, is gravitating under the influence of forces that it can neither comprehend nor control, towards such associations and policies wherein, as indicated by Abdu'l-Baha, tr her true destiny must lie. Both the community of the American believers who are aware of that source and the great mass of their countrymen who have not as yet recognized the hand that directs their destiny are contributing, each in its own way, to the realization of the hopes and the fulfillment of the promises voiced in the above-quoted words of Abdu'l-Baha. The world is moving on. Its events are unfolding ominously and with bewildering rapidity. The whirlwind of its passions is swift and alarmingly violent. The new world is being insensibly drawn into its vortex. The potential storm centers of the earth are already casting their shadows upon its shores. Dangers, undreamt of and unpredictable, threaten it both from within and from without. Its governments and peoples are being gradually enmeshed in the coils of the world's current recurrent crises and fierce controversies. The Atlantic and Pacific Oceans are, with every acceleration in the march of science, steadily shrinking into mere channels. The Great Republic of the West finds itself particularly and increasingly involved. Distant rumblings echo menacingly in the ebullitions of its people. On its flanks are ranged the potential storm centers of the European continent and of the Far East. On its southern horizon there looms what might conceivably develop into another center of agitation and danger. The world is contracting into a neighborhood. America, willingly or unwillingly, must face and grapple with this new situation. For purposes of national security, let alone any humanitarian motive, she must assume the obligations imposed by this newly created neighborhood. Paradoxical as it may seem, her only hope of extricating herself from the perils gathering around her is to become entangled in that very web of international association which the hand of inscrutable providence is weaving. Page 88. Abdul Baha's counsel to a highly placed official in its government comes to mind with peculiar appropriateness and force. You can best serve your country if you strive in your capacity as a citizen of the world to assist in the eventual application of the principle of federalism underlying the government of your own country to the relationships now existing between the peoples and nations of the world. The ideals that fired the imagination of America's tragically unappreciated president, whose high endeavors, however much nullified by a visionless generation, Abdul Baha, through his own pen, acclaimed as signalizing the dawn of the most great peace, though now lying in the dust and bitterly reproach a, hem a heedless generation for having so cruelly abandoned them. That the world is beset with perils, that dangers are now accumulating and are actually threatening the American nation, no clear-eyed observer can possibly deny. The earth is now transformed into an armed camp. As much as 50 million men are either under arms or in reserve. No less than the sum of 3 million billion pounds is being spent in one year on its armaments. The light of religion is dimmed and moral authority disintegrating. The nations of the world have, for the most part, fallen a prey to battling ideologies 
but threatened to disrupt the very foundations of their dearly won political unity. Agitated multitudes in these countries see them with discontent, are armed to the teeth, are stampeded with fear, and groan beneath a yoke of tribulations engendered by political strife, racial fanaticism, national hatreds, and religious animosities. Quote, the winds of despair, Baha'u'llah has unmistakably affirmed, are, alas, blowing from every direction, and the strife that divides and afflicts the human race is daily increasing. The signs of impending convulsions and chaos can now be discerned. End quote. Quote, the ills, Abdul Baha, writing as far back as two decades ago, has prophesied, from which the world now suffers will multiply. The gloom which envelops it will deepen. The Balkans will remain discontented. Its restlessness will increase. The vanquished powers will continue to agitate. They will resort to every measure that may rekindle the flame of war. Movements, newly born and worldwide in their range, will exert their utmost for the advancement of their designs. The movement of the left will acquire great importance. Its influence will spread. End quote. As to the American nation itself, the voice of its own president, emphatic and clear, warns his people that a possible attack upon their country has been brought infinitely closer by the development of aircraft and by other factors. Its Secretary of State, addressing at a recent conference the assembled representatives of all the American republics, utters no less ominous a warning. Quote, These resurgent forces loom threateningly throughout the world. Their ominous shadows fall as a thwart athwart our own hemisphere, end quote. As to its press, the same note of warning and of alarm at an ap approaching danger is struck. Quoting, We must be prepared to defend ourselves both from within and without. Our defensive frontier is long. It reaches from Alaska's Point Barrow to Cape Horn and ranges the Atlantic and the Pacific. When or where Europe's and Asia's aggressors may strike us, at us no one can say. It could be anywhere, any time. We have no option save to go armed ourselves. We must mount vigilant guard over the Western Hemisphere. End quote. The distance that the American nation has traveled since its formal and categoric repudiation of the Wilsonian ideal, the changes that have unexpectedly overtaken it in recent years, the direction in which world events are moving, with their inevitable impact on the policies and the economy of that nation, are to every Baha'i observer viewing the developments in the international situation in the light of the prophecies of both Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha most significant and highly instructive and encouraging. To trace the exact course which in these troubled times and pregnant years this nation will follow would be impossible. We can only, judging from the direction of its affairs are now, its affairs are now taking, anticipate the course she will most likely choose to pursue in her relationships with both the republics of America and the countries of the remaining continents. A closer association with those republics on the one hand and an increased participation in varying degrees on the other in the affairs of the whole world as a result of recurrent international crises appear as the most likely developments which the future has in store for that country. Delays must inevitably arise, setbacks must be suffered in the course of that country's evolution towards its ultimate destiny. Nothing, however, can alter eventually that course ordained for it by the unerring pen of Abu Baha, its federal unity having already been achieved and its internal institutions consolidated, a stage that marked its coming of age as a political entity. Its further evolution as a member of the family of nations must, under circumstances that cannot at present be visualized, steadily continue. Such an evolution must persist until such time when that nation will, through the active and decisive part it will have played in the organization and the peaceful settlement of the affairs of mankind, have attained the plenitude of its power and functions as an outstanding member and component part of a federated world. The immediate future must, as a result of this steady, this gradual and inevitable absorption in the manifold perplexities and problems afflicting humanity, be dark and oppressive for that nation. The world-shaking ordeal which Baha'u'llah, as quoted in the foregoing passages, has so graphically prophesied, may find it swept to an unprecedented degree into its vortex. Out of it, it will probably emerge, unlike its reactions to the last world conflict, consciously determined to seize its opportunity to bring the full weight of its influence to bear upon the gigantic problems that such an ordeal must leave in its wake, and to exercise forever, in conjunction with its sister nations of both the East and the West, the greatest curse which, from time immemorial, has afflicted and degraded the human race. 
Then and only then will the American nation, molded and purified in the crucible of a common war, inured to its rigors and disciplined by its lessons, be in a position to raise its voice in the councils of the nations, itself lay the cornerstone of a universal and enduring peace, proclaim the solidarity, the unity, and maturity of mankind, and assist in the establishment of the promised reign of righteousness on earth. Then and only then will the American nation, while the community of the American believers within its heart is consummating its divinely appointed mission, be able to fulfill the unspeakably glorious destiny ordained for it by the Almighty and immortally enshrined in the writings of Abdu Baha. Then and only then will the American nation accomplish quote, that which will adorn the pages of history, become the envy of the world, and be blessed in both the East and the West. End quote. Shogi, December 25, 1938. This concludes the reading of the book, The Advent of Divine Justice, ending on page 91.